Hello, everyone. If you can take your seats, that would be wonderful. We have a hundred of a hundred years of history to go over. Can you take down the echo a little bit? Let's try now. Okay, is this better? Is this better? A little bit. Okay, I will also project. Dana's grandmother would say, enunciate and speak clearly. Good evening, everyone. If you can please join us, that would be wonderful. We have more seat on, seats on this side. Please uh, mind, uh, mind the cables here. We're doing our best to protect you. Yes, there is a glass of wine right there, so just be careful. Yeah. So feel free, please feel free to grab uh, to grab some fruit or dessert, and uh, I will get us going because we do have a hundred years to go over. And um, and I I want to first and foremost welcome everyone. My name is Erez Cohen. I'm the executive director of Hillel at the University of Illinois for the past ten years. And I, I want to uh, start by thanking all the partners who supported tonight's event. And first and foremost, I want to thank the Champaign County History Museum, uh, who is co-hosting this event. And we are actually holding, we have more spots on this side if you want to squeeze in. Uh, we're actually holding this event as part of the Champaign County History Museum History Talk. Um, and I, I want to invite Connor to come and say a few words. Well, uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you, everyone, for such a warm welcome to Hillel. Uh, this is my first time coming here, but uh, as Erez mentioned, this is part of our, our ongoing history talk series. Every month, we invite a local scholar or researcher to talk about uh, important events, organizations, and artifacts within the community. And um, when I was talking with Erez, I, I just felt that this was such a important story, but also such an interesting story that has a, a real impact on our community all the way from 1923 to today. Um, I, I'm very grateful for working with him on this project, but we're also going to be working on future projects. This fall, we're going to be starting a lobby exhibit at the museum devoted to Illini Hillel's history and showcasing several artifacts from the organization's history. And I do hope that uh, you'll keep up to date with our, our uh, work on that project because that will be coming soon. And we hope you'll be there for the opening reception when it comes in the fall. So thank you very much. Thank you, Connor. And thank you to the museum for this partnership. We're really, really happy to have you in our space and we're ha happy to come to your space next. So thank you. Next, I want to thank our co-sponsors from near and far. Thank you to the Champaign-Urbana Jewish Federation, Sinai Temple, Springfield, Peoria, and the Quad Cities Jewish Federations, and the Chicago Jewish Historical Society for joining us on, in on supporting this event. A special thank you goes, where is Alex? A special thank you goes to the Champaign-Urbana Jewish Endowment Foundation. The Endowment Foundation is holding many of Hillel's endowment funds. As part of our centennial campaign, we are raising funds to our endowments. We are glad to have CUJEF as a partner in this effort. And 
I would like to invite you all to consider giving a gift to Hillel's Endowment through CUJEF. I wrote myself pause. Think about the offer. I'm very humbled to be with you all tonight uh, and attempt to summarize a hundred years of Hillel's history into an hour and a half. And I can tell you in advance, this attempt will fail. There is no chance that I will be able to encompass everything that's worth mentioning into this one lecture. There are, there are things that simply cannot fit in the time frame and the format that we have today. What's more, there are many stories that simply have not crossed my desk yet. And if you're leaving today thinking that there is something that Ares really should have said but didn't, it might be because I just don't know it yet. And I would like to invite you to call me, to email me, to schedule a time with me, and I will sit down and listen, and we will find a way to document all these stories. So let's go down that path together. In addition, I'm already off script. Um, in addition, looking across this room, um, I can see decades of Jewish history of Champaign-Urbana. And the Champaign Jewish community has been intertwined with Hillel since its inception. In an attempt not to bore you with history that you already know, I'm going to, to put heavier focus on the first 50 years of Hillel rather than the latter 50 years. I promise you that some of the stories will still be familiar. Lastly, lastly, before we start, many of you know that I am an amateur family historian. And as such, I view history as a collection of stories that build a narrative. In this talk, I will bring up stories of individuals, groups, unique moments from the past 100 years. Each story is unique, but together they form the fabric that put Hillel together into an ever-evolving organization that tries to bring together Jewish students, faculty members, and community members alike. If there is one thing that I would like you to take from tonight's talk is that Hillel was created in 1923 to support every Jewish student in every way. And 100 years later, we still do it. It seems simple, thank you. Uh, it's gonna be a long speech, we don't need to do this. Um, but thank you, Mars. It, it seems simple, but inclusion was not easy for Jewish students in the 1920s, and it is not easy in our fractured world today either. And with that, let's hit the road. Let me see if technology, technology will work with me, yes. It's the 1920s. Prohibition is in effect across the United States. Urbana-Champaign has a university that is slowly figuring itself out. The Altgal chimes have just been installed in the turn of the decade. Their sound still amazes our campus. Maybe not this year, but it's gonna come back. University High School opens its doors in 1921. In 1922 commencement, Lorado Taft presents the campus with a plaster cast of a new statue. The future copper cast, he said, will be called Alma Mater. In honor of the classes of 1914 to 1921, who are gifting it to future generations of students. Student life is already thriving at the University of Illinois with fraternities and sororities that are fast forming on campus. Clubs offer sports and social opportunity. Dad's Day and Mom's Day have just been established alongside prospective as associations. Go Illini. It is true, it is a true period of social innovation and development at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. However, with this development, within this development embedded a, very, a, a form of systematic bias. Many of the social organizations on campus carried standard bylaws that only accept church goers on Sunday. This clearly excludes the vast majority of the Jewish student population on campus. It is not 
unique to the University of Illinois and has become a common issue to Jewish students all across the country. As the university grows, so do the sister cities of Champaign and Urbana. The growing, the growing reform Jewish community decides to invite rabbinical interns from Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati to lead services and organize the Jewish community. There is a long debate in the congregation about who should enjoy these services. As a rabbinical intern arrives in town in 1921, he was born in Peoria in 1897, so he knows the area pretty well. He was very tall and had a very strong build and soon becomes known as a kind and gentle giant, Rabbi Benjamin Frankel. Frankel interns at, uh, with Sinai Temple on a part-time basis, leading religious services and officiating weddings, bar mitzvahs, and other milestone rituals. With support from both the Kaufman family and the Kuhn family, Frankel agrees to stay as the pulpit rabbi, part-time pulpit rabbi for Sinai Temple upon his ordination in 1923. Now, our Hillel folklore tells us that a non-Jewish religions professor named Edward Chauncey Baldwin reached out to Rabbi Frankel and informed him about 200 Jewish students at the University of Illinois that have no spiritual guidance and you, Rabbi Frankel, need to take care of it. The real story though, as it reads from the pages of Sinai's history book, Amid the Alien Corn, is that there was an awareness of the needs of Jewish students that dates back to 1914. The topic actually caused a tear in the community. Get ready for some drama. Isaac Kuhn, the owner of the famous jo Joseph Kuhn and Co. store, who supported building the Sinai Temple Synagogue on campus at the corner of Fourth and Daniel. Alan will talk later. Um, he, um, he was promoting the idea that students and community members should come and enjoy services together. On the other hand, Hetty Kaufman, whose family also owned the store downtown, supported building the synagogue downtown. Baldwin is listed in the book as involved in the debate as early as 1916, and even connected Kuhn with Sears President Julius Rosenwald in an attempt to solicit funds for a campus location of the temple. Who won? Hillel won. When it was settled that the structure would be built downtown, Kuhn began lobbying to hire a full-time rabbi who would provide the community the services it needs and spiritual guidance for Jewish students. Two faculty members who supported Kuhn's view were professors Simon Littman and Armin Kohler. Um, Kohler would later lead programs and services in both Sinai Temple and Hillel and would be a bridge between the communities. His grandchildren have recently endowed a communications internship at Hillel. To add one last fun note about the Kuhn Kohler connection, Alice Berkson, Kohler's granddaughter, and Bill Youngerman, Kuhn's son, are now neighbors and friends, and their families even enjoy an occasional meal together. Talking about Midor Lador from generation to generation. So back to the 1920s. Whether Frankel knew about the student need from Baldwin, who wasn't Jewish, or from members of the congregation, the result was the same. As he accepted the part-time position at Sinai, he requested an additional stipend to work with the students. Soon enough, there was a crowd of students there was a crowd of students gathered around the charismatic Frankel with much interest in getting involved. During the summer of 1923, Frankel traveled, uh, traveled with Kuhn and Chicago's Rabbi Louis Mann to raise the required funds for establishing a Jewish student foundation. They approached Rosenwald once again, who agreed to pay Frankel's salary for three years, including programmatic expenses and rent a location for Hillel above Candy's Barber Shop. You all know it, it's on East Green Street. Frankel aimed to have Hillel serve all Jewish students, regardless of their religious denomination or national background. 
To those who are not familiar with Jewish history of the early 1900s, there is a few in the crowd, I will share that, I, I will share that Jewish immigrants came to America in waves. More, most recently, in the past 120 years or so, the, the first one was a wave of, of Jewish Germans, mostly reform, um, which sought to adapt the Jewish religion to modernity. In contrast, the next wave after was immigrants from Eastern Europe, including countries like Poland, Russia, Ukraine, and Lithuania. And they were Orthodox in denomination. They sought to follow practices that formed hundreds of years before their time. By 1923 on campus, there was a mix of Jewish students that, that did not allow for the dominance of one group over another. To create a Jewish student organization, everyone had to be included. Frankel designed Hillel II, and I quote, and you can read this quote right here if you'd like, serve all Jewish students regardless of their backgrounds, Jewish ideologies, or denominations. It is, it is Hillel is, welcoming for, to every type of Jewish interest or expression in the campus community. In October 1923, the students elected, did I see? yes, I'm still here. Uh, the students elected uh, their first board, Morris Sostrin was elected president. Louis Ehrenreich, who Mayan and I just learned is a grandfather of Jan Scholem, was elected vice president. And Mildred Lazarus was elected secretary. That is to show off the bat that women were playing a part in the leadership of Hillel from its first year. It was indeed an organization for everyone. The first official event for Hillel was held on Dad's Weekend, November 1923. It included a musical performance and a reception that followed. Mildred, Hillel's new secretary, was in charge of on distributing the, uh, the Jewish student survey to participants. The survey would help determine the needs of Jewish students on campus and would help dictate what Hillel would do in the coming year. The day of the opening, the Daily Illini published the column, Welcome to Hillel, that all of you can find on your seats as you were coming in. Um, you can take it home with you. It's a 100-year-old souvenir. Rabbi Frankel and his student board jumped into action right away. The organization, I'm pretty sure that I skipped the slide. Let's see. There we go. Um, the organization comprised of several wings, the student board, governing the general campus organization, and we do have our student board president present, even though it's summer. Uh, the social committee organizing social gatherings for students, including tea time, smoking hours, dances, dance shows, and more. An open forum lecture series that brought in many speakers from within the community and beyond, including Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, senators, mayors, professors, and more. Re religious, a religious education committee that involved the local menorah club, which was a Jewish learning group, and religious services, mainly led by Rabbi Frankel himself. In later years, Hillel added a student-published newspaper, an, or an orchestra, and much more. Rabbi Frankel was so excited about the success of the organization locally that he reached out to the Jewish fraternal organization of Naperith and invited them to sponsor the expansion of Hillel to other campuses. Wisconsin, always to be second after us, <laughs> um, was established in 1924, followed by Michigan and Ohio State. So all is in the right order. <laughs> Under the umbrella of Naperith, Hillel became a Jewish movement across campuses. Locally, Hillel worked Hillel's work invigorated Jewish students' involvement immediately, and we have the numbers to show it. Sinai Temple's history mentioned that only 100 students on campus formally identified as Jewish in 1923. By the summer of 1924, 600 students identified as Jewish at the University of Illinois. So the 
So Hill, both Hillel and the Jewish community were thriving. One of, one of these students was Florence Konigsberg. Coming from the northwest side of Chicago, she got involved in the summer of 1923 with the recently established A5 chapter on campus. In her memoir, she wrote, The sorority introduced us to Sinai Temple and Hillel, and encouraging us to become active. I was overwhelmed by the first, by the first services and all the services and the rabbi. A year later, Frankel and Konigsberg were already dating and discussing wedding plans. They married in 1926 and went on a honeymoon in British Mandate Palestine, Israel. As she describes, the most important thing that semester of 1927 was the plan Ben had for our marriage. His mother and younger brother, MJ, were in Palestine for a year. He was getting married in May to an English girl, Dory, who lived in Jerusalem. Ben could leave in March as there was an assistant rabbi for Hillel. On March 20th, we were married in Chicago. We left immediately for New York, where we boarded an Italian ship for two weeks. Then from Naples, we went on a small ship to Port Said and then to Yaffa. His mother was living for one year in Tel Aviv in what was called a pension, really a small hotel. We were there in time for Passover, and Ben was asked to do the Seder. Thank you, Evan. She'll be back, don't worry. In the following year, Frankel continued to invest time and effort in expanding Hillel, but later in the fall of 1927, both Florence and Ben got sick with the flu. While Florence recovered, Ben continued to deteriorate. On December, uh, December 21st, 1927, Rabbi Benjamin Freckle, the founder and director of Hillel, died from a heart condition as a result of the flu at the age of 30, leaving behind Florence as a 20-year-old widow. I wrote this and it's going to get me emotional. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Rabbi Frankel did not have any children. The millions of Jewish students involved with Hillel across the world are his legacy. But to give some closure about Florence, Florence continued on to law school at the University of Michigan, <laughs> where she met her second husband, Jean. She was the first woman in Michigan to get into the honorary law order of the coif. Jean and her married and had two children. One of them, Joan, later married Stanley Levy and moved to Champaign with him. Stan served as the Dean of Men before it was titled the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. Joan and Stan now live in Cleveland, Ohio, and I had the pleasure of uh, spending some time at their house two years ago. Well, to fill the enormous vacuum left after Rabbi Frankel's death, Rabbi Lewis Mann from Chicago stepped into the role of director for just under a year. Eventually, though, Rabbi Frankel's roommate and best friend, Professor Abraham Sacker, took the helm of both Hillel at the University of Illinois and the national directorship of the Hillel movement. Sacker came to Champaign in 1923 after finishing his PhD from Cambridge in English history. His original intent was to teach at the University of Indiana. I don't know why, <laughs> but he wanted to. But perhaps a mention of his Jewish identity in a recommendation letter was the cause of the dissolution of the offer he had from the university back then. Luckily for us, he ended up here. Sacker became involved with Hillel immediately. He and Frankel moved in as roommates while dating their prospective future wives, Thelma and Florence. Sacker researched Jewish, Jewish history and wrote several prominent books about Jewish history and taught courses for credit through Hilla. When he, when we do have members of the Jewish Studies Program, and I appreciate you, and thank you for continuing that legacy now. You can always teach course, your courses physically here, and we'll. We'll recreate the wheel. 
Um, when he stepped in as a director of Hillel, though, he breathed second life into the organization. Though not ordained, he led services at both Hillel and Sinai Temple as a full-fledged rabbi. He officiated many life cycle events in the community and beyond. Sacker was appointed the national director of Hillel as part of Nabrith in 1933, and he kept the title and the headquarters of Hillel in Champaign until 1947. Hillel of the time was flourishing, and student leaders brought Jewish pride all across campus. On March 10, 1936, the Bnei Brith Hillel Post reported on many things that are Hillel. He chaired that Johannes Steele will come to speak about world, world affairs as part of the Hillel Open Forum. He talked about the work on the Hillel stunt show, something that we should bring back, I think. An annual event that attracted hundreds of students each year. It proudly reported that 350 students were enrolled in Hillel courses that received university credit. And it spoke about the founding meeting of the Avuka chapter on campus. Avuka was a Zionist student group that promoted the establishment of a Jewish homeland in the Jewish ancestral land of Israel. These first pages of Hillel's newspaper represents well the mix of Hillel that we're known for social, cultural, religious, educational Jewish needs. But we cannot ignore that 1936, during 1936, darker things were playing out in the world. Three years after the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party to power in Germany, Hillel students became aware of the deteriorating conditions for Jews in Germany. The Post reported for the first time that two students learned about Jews fleeing Germany because of the way Nazi authorities were treating them. They approached Sacker about this, and he did what all Hillel professionals do to this day. He empowered them to take action. And the Post reports, They came back in a few days with a pledge of more than $50. And the fine example of the fraternity has been taken up by other groups, entirely without sponsorship from the outside, without pressure from Hillel or its staff, the pledges are being quietly made and collected, and it is expected that nearly $300 may result to help in the merciful work of relief and emigration. The sum is a tiny drop in the bucket. It will pay for the emigration of two German refugees but the spirit is more important than the actual contribution. It is exhilarating to have this voluntary student response. Thank you, Heather. Mm -hmm. on, one hand, on one hand, tonight we, we are celebrating the, the, this moment of student empowerment. Hillel's mission is to enrich the lives of Jewish students so that they can enrich others in the world. And we are achieving it in this very moment. But the deeper context, Hillel at the University of Illinois was the first Hillel to take in two Jewish German refugees. These are two lives that have been potentially saved from the mass genocide against the Jews of Europe that was conducted by Nazi Germany in the following years. The students who started this initiative will unfortunately remain anonymous, unsung heroes, as their names are not mentioned. But they, they have inspired Abraham Sacker to promote to promote refugee programs in the following years in all Hillels. Hillel be began to sponsor student visas for Jewish refugees, saving hundreds of lives before, during, and after the Holocaust. On November 1st, 1940, for example, the Hillel Post reported on the arrival of five Jewish refugees. Um, the refugees were housed and became members of sororities and fraternities, where they can, as the article says, live above fear of stormtroopers and blitzkriegs. While involved in saving Jews from Europe, Hillel mainly continued with its regular activities. However, the attack on Pearl Harbor disrupted the campus lifestyle, and Hillel's work took a significant turn. Abram Sacker suggested that all Hillels with military bases in their vicinity 
would do outreach to the bases and offer Jewish services and support to the soldiers. Hillel at the University of Illinois was once again the flagship of that experience. Students were working with soldiers in Chanut Air Base and provided entertainment, food, and support. This collaboration would last long after the war. We'll get back to that. I have a story. But the attack on Pearl Harbor led to an additional shift locally. It awakened the Jewish student body to partake in the war. Howard Cohen was Hillel's student president in 1940. He was in Tau Delta Phi and was well known on campus, including being part of the homecoming court. Cohen wrote in his memoir about how Pearl Harbor changed his life. On December 7th, 1941, I was in the hospital at school with pneumonia and heard the news on the radio that Pearl Harbor was bombed. That evening, I heard the students marching through the streets, singing patriotic songs and demonstrating against the Japanese. I knew then that our world would never quite be the same. On February 16, 1942, on my 21st birthday, I registered for the draft as required. In March, recruiters from the Navy and the Marine Corps came down to school seeking volunteers for their officer training programs. I decided I did not want the Army, so I, I went to volunteer for either the Marine Corps or the Navy. I called my mother and she said to choose the Navy because they sleep on clean sheets. <laughs> This I did and was selected for the Navy program that was for college graduates. I was scheduled to graduate that June. Colin was one of many Jewish students at the University of Illinois who enlisted. He was in a naval base in Hawaii for V-Day. He, li he lived a long life and passed away in 2009. After 66 years of marriage, leaving behind children, grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. I just want to take a pause from my own script and say that this, this slide, I feel like, I hope Dana Rabin is proud of me because we actually managed to find the Daily Illini article that says that he was in the hospital and was released on the same dates, right? Yes, so good history work, um, I hope. But unfortunately, not all of our soldiers survived. Some died in battle and others in other military actions. Just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago on Memorial Day, we commemorated Milt Goldfarb and Sherman Levy. May their memory be a blessing. The Jewish student community at the University of Illinois paid a painful price in defense of the nation. Despite the war waging, Hillel is about to go through some of its most important changes. Number one, Hillel begins to fundraise for its own building again. A Hillel building fund was already established in the 1930s, but the Big Depression made the goal of $40,000 unattainable. Instead, they did a, a renovation of the space that they owned on the store on Green Street. In 1944, though, efforts resumed with leadership from major community members, including one of Hillel's longtime champions, Isaac Kuhn, in his kickoff letter to the, to, to the campaign in January 1944, Sacker writes the following. It is especially gratifying that the Building Fund campaign should be launched in the midst of the war. Even in crisis times, we believe in tomorrow. We envision the day when normal routines of peace will be resumed. As a Hillel director that directed this Hillel through COVID-19, I think I get it. Other community leaders joined the campaign for the building. Hillel's chairman at the time was Sam Schmickler. Sam was the owner of the Illinois Glove Company in Effingham, Illinois, a factory that, that greatly contributed to the war effort. Schmickler and the board bought two lots at the corner of John and Fifth Streets. 
they moved Hillel's location to a house on the premises. I must fast forward here for a second and share with you uh, that Sam Schmickler's great-granddaughter, Hannah, right here, um, would become a Hillel leader here at the University of Illinois in 1914. And like her great-grandfather, 2014? Sorry, 2014. <laughs> now that's going to be an interesting movie. Um, uh, in 2014, and like her great-grandfather, she, uh, she contributed significant to Hillel, significantly to Hillel by forming the Hillel International Student Cabinet that brought together student leaders from all across the world. What's more, a, a little moment of pride and nachas, Hannah just got engaged last Monday, and we are incredibly excited for her. Maybe she's on Zoom right now with us. Um, Another local family, oh, there we go. Another local family, uh, I wrote it without the Ellen. <laughs> um, and, uh, the joint in support of the building of the campaign, uh, in, the, in the building campaign was the Lewis family. Brothers Leonard and Herman Lewis made a generous contribution to name the great hall in Hillel, in the Hillel building after their fa father, Wolf Lewis, who was the owner of the W. Lewis & Co. department store um, in downtown Champaign. Wolf was involved in leadership positions uh, with both Sinai Temple and Hillel and supported many Jewish causes. And because I'm seeing that I'm reading this way too fast, I'm actually going to pause and add something that I took out originally. A few more words on Wolf Lewis. Wolf Lewis came here as an immigrant but he didn't come here. He landed in New York and for some reason made his way to Wisconsin where he was trying to establish a business there. His business, business completely failed and he ended up in Champaign. Again, I'm not sure why, what brought him to Champaign, but he started um, his Wolf Lewis & Co. department store in Champaign and that burned down completely um, and then he just started it again. So a very resilient person. And the second time that he, that he started the department store, it lasted for quite some time. Uh, so much so that his sons continued the business after him. Um, but we'll do another fast forward moment here. Wolf's granddaughter, Bonnie Lewis, was involved with Hillel during her time on campus in the 1960s. More about that later. She participated in Torah classes where she met a nice Jewish boy named Ralph. They would chat about their favorite foods and favorite places to study on campus. Bonnie, for example, liked the top floor of the undergraduate library, while Ralph studied at the bottom floor. Towards the end of the course, Ralph found the courage to ask Bonnie out. She refused because Ralph was about to graduate from the University of Illinois and she had at least one more year to go. Then, however, during finals week, they both thought about each other. Ralph was studying at the undergraduate library and decided to head upstairs to see if Bonnie is around. In his rush up the stairs, he accidentally bumped into a woman. That was Bonnie, of course. She was heading downstairs to see if he was there. The two were inseparable ever since. Their granddaughter, Alyssa Mandel, recently graduated from the University of Illinois as well. I, sp I spent uh, some time with them in Florida in uh, December. If anyone wants to host me, you just say. <laughs> um, in 1947, Hillel had enough funds to hire an architect to put together a design for the building. They hired no other than University of Illinois and Illini Hillel alum, Max Abramovitz. How much of an, an Illini Hillel alum? He's mentioned in the Hillel Post five times for awards that he got as, a, as an architecture student. And he was competing with other architects that were already in the field for 20 and 30 years. 
Abramovitz was known, was known nationwide as one of the top architects in the country. He designed the UN headquarters in New York, Krenert Center for the Performing Arts, and later even the Assembly Hall, now known as the State Farm Center. It was clear that he is the right person to design the model Hillel that will be replicated across all other Hillels. And indeed, when Abramovitz was hired, he created a Hillel building design that would be built at the Northwestern University and the University of Illinois about the same time. Northwestern finished first, and that's okay. We don't hold it against them. Construction, construction began in 1949, and the building was dedicated in 1950, opening its doors officially, officially in September of 1951. The law student leadership at the time collected memorabilia and put it in a time capsule that was buried under the foundation stone of the building. If you want to see some of the pieces, that was dug out when we built the new building, and they are now available in our conference room uh, where we often go and see them. Don't go there, it's a mess. I can show you, I can show you the stuff later. Um, mm -hmm. Marbury, yes. Uh, the new building included a large sanctuary, a programmatic space in the basement, and a large kitchen. It had a library and, a lounge, and lounge spaces. It was spacious and marvelous building. Yes, I am quoting from the Daily Alignment. At the time, uh, at the time, it made a clear statement that Jewish students have a permanent space on campus for themselves. Student, students, commu students, community members, and professors alike were excited to have this building and it became a bastion of student life for the next 58 years. One person that did not get to enjoy the building, however, was Abram Sacker. In 1947, after almost 20 years of service to the Hillel movement, Sacker decided to retire. In his tenure, Sacker served as local leader, as a national director of the Hillel movement, as a fundraiser, as a lobbyist for Jewish refugees, and more and more and more. Under his tenure, Hillel movement grew from nine universities to 167 in 19 years. He thought it would be, he thought it would be a good time to take a break. As such, he moved with his family to sunny California to enjoy the ocean and some sunshine. Now, Maybe I was able to fool you for a second that someone like Sacker in Sacker's stature could actually take a break, but no. Shortly after, his, after the move to California, Sacker was invited to be the founding president of Brandeis University in Massachusetts. Within a year, they moved from California to Massachusetts and Berkeley was founded. Those who would like to follow Sacker further should read his book, and this is a heartfelt recommendation, A Host at Last. Sacker was the longest serving director of Hillel at the University of Illinois. During his time, assistant director rabbis would function as the de facto directors while he would manage the national level of the organization alongside the national uh, Bnei Brith. Hillel at the University of Illinois was different after Sacker. It was no longer the physical center of the Hillel movement. And now, with its own building, a lot more of the, prof of the professional energy was focused inwards. After his tenure, rabbis and executive director, directors stayed for shorter time periods, continuing Hillel's mission to support and empower Jewish students on all fronts. Hillel directors, and additional staff members would support student programming, help students find their voice on campus, and continue to provide religious, cultural, social, and educational services. If you keep hearing the same thing, it's because we've been doing this for 100 years. Each Hillel leader brought with them their own style. Rabbi Hirsch Cohen, for example, was known to be the matchmaker Hillel director. He served at Hillel from 1961 to 1964. If you remember, Bonnie and Ralph met at a Hillel Torah class. 
During his time, many couples formed the Tillel. One such couple were Ellen and Elaine Avner. Um, I got to tell this story again because I have a little bit of time. I'm really rushing through. So um, I interviewed Alan Avner uh, about his involvement with Hillel. He continuously told me, I wasn't really that involved with Hillel. And I said, tell me more. He said, well, sometimes I would go to Shabbat dinners. I said, sometimes how often? And he said, well, about once a week. <laughs> and I said, that's all you did? And he said, yes. Well, sometimes I would stay for the Onig afterwards. How often? Well, about once a week. <laughs> I said, okay. And he goes, but I really wasn't that involved with Hillel. I said, okay. And we continued on with the interview. And then I asked him, Alan, I don't know how you and Elaine met. What, tell me the story. And he said, oh, well, one of these times at, uh, at Hillel at the Onig, I met Elaine and we started talking and we, we became friendly. And I said, Oh, that's very interesting. Tell me about your wedding a little bit. Oh, well, the Hillel rabbi married us at Hillel. <laughs> and so by the, by the end of the conversation, I said to him, you know, Alan, maybe you weren't that involved with Hillel, but Hillel was very involved with you. <laughs> um, another, another couple, another couple story. Uh, Margie and Lewis Cohen I don't know if anyone's familiar with the names, and if not, be, please check out the front of the building when you leave. Um, Margie and Lewis Cohen met in 1964 uh, on campus uh, at a Hillel event. Their daughters gave the founding gift to build the wonderful building that we are sitting in today on the original site of the 1950s building. Um, another notable Hillel director, They're in the room, the young couple. Another notable Hillel director was Rabbi Edward Feld. Ed and his wife Merle are both incredible educators and spiritual leaders to this day. In fact, our senior Jewish educator considered, considers herself one of their students. So uh, Heather, who is reading a lot of them to us. Um, Ed has edited the newest version of the Sim Shalom conservative prayer book, which is a big deal, trust me, those who don't. Uh, and we now own them in our, in our conservative services. Uh, during their time here, they served as the campus community and com uh, they served the campus community and community at large, including officiating the wedding of Ira and Lynn Wachtel in, in 1971. Um, I had the pleasure of digitizing their uh, wedding album, and I said that I'm going to use it. Um, it's a beautiful, it's really beautiful. There's a beautiful photo here of the sanctuary, the old sanctuary, which I really appreciate. Jewish students on campus became involved in Jewish causes, such as fighting for, fighting for the rights of Soviet Jews and supporting the emerging uh, Jewish state of Israel. Students learned and educated others about the atrocities of the Holocaust and created volunteering opportunities all across the world. As I mentioned earlier in my talk, I can go into many more recent stories. But the bottom line is, once we got the building, once we established the idea of empowering Jewish students, once we created this lifelong relationship with the Champaign-Urbana Jewish community, Hillel kept doing great things, using student leadership, using professional staff, and continuing the work over and over again to make sure that these students, as they leave campus with Jewish leadership experiences, become leaders in their own communities. We were so successful that that's my Zoom, that's my Zoom background. I got confused for a second. Um, we were so successful that by the early 2000s, the Jewish community on campus was so large that it couldn't fit in the, in the old, what we call now the old building anymore. Uh, we serve around 3,500 Jewish students nowadays. Uh, what's more, a little secret about Abramowitz, 
He designed buildings with flat roofs. And it rained here. And after 58 years, side again, side story, bonus story, um, uh, Joel Schweitzer held a board meeting in the basement of Hillel, purposefully in the basement of Hillel, to explain to the board why it's time to build a new building. By the time the board meeting ended, there were, there were two inches of water on the floor of the basement because it was raining that day. And the board voted to build a new building. Um, so Joel was the executive director at the time. Um, and the Cohen Center for Jewish Life was similarly to the previous building, a great collaboration of the local Jewish community and uh, money coming from Chicago and work of the students and work of the professional staff. The Libman, Mervis, Weiner families, and many, many others, uh, pretty much most of the people in this room, so I'm, I'm feeling very humble right now, um, were all contributors to the cause and gave from their, the kindness of their hearts and here we are today in this beautiful space. From 2008, uh, in the 2008, 2009 school year, Hillel opened its doors of a new building on the same address. I can tell you all about the amazing spaces, but honestly, you can take the tour later. We're here, it's great. You should, you should look around if you haven't yet. And I, I'm, I'm willing to show you around. Uh, my girls are already in bed, so I'm not running anywhere. Today, Hillel at the University of Illinois serves 3,500 Jewish students and their peers. Hillel's mission has not changed. We still work to enrich the lives of Jewish students and their peers so that they can enrich the, li the life of others in the world. We still abide by Rabbi Frankel's values of pluralism, inclusion, Jewish pride, and Jewish learning. We still hold large social events and explore our Jewish identities. Not unlike the Jewish students of the 1920s, however, Jewish students today are also experiencing anti-Semitism. But for 100 years now, they have a place to come to when they do. Hillel today is at least as relevant and as necessary in the lives of Jewish students as it was 100 years ago. Knowing past great deeds of lay leaders, Hillel Jewish professionals, and most importantly, Jewish students, at the University of Illinois. I'm excited to see what the next 100 years are going to bring to us. To ensure, I have to do this, to ensure that we are set for success for the next 100 years, we launched the Centennial Campaign and celebration with the goal of raising $10 million in endowment funds and collect the history of our organization. I want to thank all the individuals and their families who already co contributed to both of these efforts. Thank you all for listening. And if I time this right, amazing. <laughs> we should have ample time for questions and answer. Thank you. Good morning. Um, any questions? Yes, Ehud. Yes. Um, state state of the university uh, in terms of in terms of uh, in anti-Semitism and Jewish life, I will say. Um, we we've had we've had. I want to start by saying anti-Semitism is rising nationally, and not just on college campuses. Um, and it's and it's coming in um, several forms. And Deborah, Deborah Lipstadt has, uh, has a great um, way of, of describing anti-Semitism as it is the one hatred that punches down against, against the, the people that are being hated, but also punches up 
what does that mean? It means that um, a couple of years ago, pretty much at the height of COVID, there were a bunch of, there, not a bunch, two people were driving around campus and throwing flyers that say that Jews spread COVID. And that is classical anti-Semitism that punches down, says Jews are dirty, they spread disease. But at the same time, the other flyers that they spread said that Jews control the government. So they're, they're weak and dirty and spread disease, but at the same time, they control everything. That's the punching up. Um, so we've experienced that on, on this campus, but this was a national, a national movement to do this. This was done at the Ohio State University. This was done in some of the suburbs in Chicago. We are sometimes victims of national campaigns. If you remember earlier this year, there was the National Day of Hate that we were all concerned about. Um, but luckily for us, not a lot of people subscribe to, I'm going to be hateful today. Uh, so, so that exists. We do find, we do find uh, swastikas on campus. Uh, we've had several incidents where a couple of professors had swastikas drawn on their doors. Uh, we've had uh, cases where they were found in uh, restrooms of dorms, um, of instructional facilities on campus. I'll, I'll get to what we can do, but that's, that's one thing that, that we're experiencing. And then the other thing that we're experiencing a lot on this campus is uh, anti-Semitism that, that relates to, to the existence of Israel. And uh, our Jewish students are often being targeted as the, because you're Jewish, you must be siding with Israel and will hold you accountable to what's happening in the Middle East. And that's, that's just taking all of us and putting us in one box and making, making statements about all of us based on something that we don't have control of. Uh, so these are the two types of anti-Semitism that are playing out the strongest on our campus for the past few years. I will say this past year has been the quietest it's been in seven years now. It's been pretty rough for seven years to the point that a year, a year and a little bit ago, we had an incident here in the building. Um, if you read papers, you've been familiar with it. That's been resolved. I will say the following. Uh, it is important to us that, uh, that we do two things. One, when we see anti-Semitism, it's important to call it out and to explain to people why is this anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic, not just to say this is anti-Semitic, but why? Because we need to educate our environment about what anti-Semitism is. It might be clear to us because we're experiencing it, but it's not clear to the person in front of you who's not Jewish. The other thing that, that I want to, to say is it's really important for us to educate the larger community and to support different groups in the larger community, even in times that we're not suffering an emergency. Uh, and that's something that we need to continue working on. And that includes teaching about what is this Jewish holiday that's coming up. A couple of people commented on, on the fact that I wrote, I wrote a, a, you know, a letter to the editor about Shavuot. It's just a way of getting the word out there to say, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is why we do it. And it, and it, helps, it helps to build understanding around us. So, uh, one is if you see something happening, call it out, but, it, but explain why. And the other is continue to build relationships and educate about the Jewish, the Jewish community and the needs of the Jewish community. But in the process, let's all also learn about the needs of the other communities around us. Because if the, the only way that we can grow is the Champaign-Urbana community is by actually becoming a community, right? Getting to know each other. It's much easier to explain to one of my friends why am I hurting than to a stranger that I don't know. Uh, so that's my that's my that's my go. Um, that's my take on this, and and um, I'm hoping to report next year that this year was quieter than last year. That's that's my hope. We'll have to wait and see. Any other questions? Yes. Correct, yes. 
a great question. Um, um, Hillel was Hillel was a Jewish sage. There were actually two Hillels, but I don't want to confuse you too much. So I'm going to stick with the first. Um, right? Um, so, so not to confuse. I'll stick with the first. The first was fundamental um, scholar that helped transition Judaism from a sacrificial religion that was that had a sacrificial center in Jerusalem that was destroyed by the Romans, by the way, in 70 AD. Again, it's important to read the news. Um, so, so that was the temple. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. The Jewish people was exiled from the land of Israel. Um, and then all of a sudden, there was no place this connects to Shavuot because Shavuot you, people used to go to Jerusalem to bring sacrifices. Um, all of a sudden, you have no place to bring your sacrifices to. What's going to happen to Judaism? So Hillel was one of the reformers, dare I say. Uh, that, that basically said, we're going to switch over from sacrifices to prayer. And, um, and he was pretty progressive in his thought process. He said some of his most famous quotes are, and this is, by the way, this is the essence of what we do here. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? Meaning we as Jewish people need to advocate for ourselves. No one else is going to do it for us. But if I'm only for myself, who am I? Okay, we are part of this community, the larger community, and we need to be part of everything else as well. And if not now, when? And my uh, my mentor, my mentor in the Hillel movement, Susanna Sagan, tells me that I'm putting the emphasis on the sentence in the wrong place. And she says, if not now, when? Right? Like, what are you going to do it if not now? Not like the, the urgency necessarily, but make sure you schedule it. So one way or another, this works well. The, the point is get into action. And, uh, and, and that's, that's one of his most famous um, quotes. The other famous quote, which actually was appropriate to the time, um, was um, love thy neighbor as thyself. And it's, again, 70 AD. We're talking about a lot of social movements that were in that land area at the time that spoke about love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, so, so that's, uh, that's Hillel, that's where it's, that word comes from. There's a second Hillel in the 11th century, also very important and very critical, but we'll, we'll run a Hillel class for that, not for credit. <laughs> yes, yes, Rabbi Frankel, Rabbi, well, that's what, that's what the, the that's what the Sinai Temple book tells me, um, and, and it sounds about right, that someone would bring it a name and a suggestion, but it could be one of the students. I don't know. According to Sina Temple's book, that's, that's, that's the answer. Yeah, yeah. I'll just share my personal history. Yes, Itai. So, is there a difference between the one that's taking the question to the right person? <laughs> uh, did you bring a contract? Um, yes, I'm 50% I'm of the way. We talked about it, about this earlier today. That uh, it makes me the the second. This is important because there are people that stayed here longer than I than I am in, in professional capacity. Um, and I, and I was I was trying to I, I was going to talk a little bit about Marlene, uh, but I was afraid that I was not going to have enough time. So Marlene, good friend, uh, was the uh, office manager here for 20 years. Um, so now I'll tell two stories about myself in, in, in this context. Um, one is Joel Schweitzer is the guy that, that for some reason hired me to be the Israel fellow 13 years back. Um, so, so I guess two crazy people took a chance with me. One was Joel and the other was John Lowenstein 10 years ago. But um, uh, so that's, so I owe Joel my first and second job. Um, but Marlene was the first person I met at Hillel. Um, and, and she was, she was here for 20 years. Uh, the first thing she did was to offer me candy, uh, which is still my main source of nutrition at Hillel. And, um, uh, and, and she's been wonderful to work with. And, uh, uh, because of COVID, my, my 
dates are kind of vague, but I can tell you that three months before she passed, um, I've been begging her for years to send, she said, I have this beautiful photo album with all these photos of Hillel students, and I would love to send them to you. And I asked and I asked and I asked for years. Uh, three months before she passed, I got, I got an email with all these photos. And, uh, and it was one of the best gifts I, I've got while I was here. So um, yeah, so she's, she's greatly missed. And uh, as she is named, she was and is still a good friend. Um, so there is people that have been here longer than I am. Uh, but yes, I'm the second, I'm the second longest uh, reigning, I don't know. I don't know, Ten, tenured uh, <laughs> uh, serving is better. Yeah, that's what I feel most of the time. Um, so, so yeah, that, yeah, and uh, I don't know. Come back in 10 years, see if I'm still here. <laughs> really depending on if we can pull this uh, $10 million, just saying no pressure. <laughs> um, uh, Sacker, Sacker was the longest, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, which uh, which is where I took a lot of my sources from. But I mean, I I, I uh, name cited amid the alien corn. The Hillel post is online, searchable. Uh, we have found you don't know this yet. We have found uh, some of the missing copies of the Hillel post. Someone who used to be in this community and was the interim director for a year picked them up when the building was being demolished. But Rafe sent them to me, so now we're going to put them in the library. Um, so, but I'm glad he saved them because he actually saved them um, because a lot of stuff was thrown away when the building was being destroyed. So, um, so he saved them and sent, sent them to me with a bunch of other materials just a few months ago. So if you have materials that belong to Hillel, please bring them back. Uh, not necessarily library books. Those ask me first. Um, but, uh, but, it, but we're making use of all the materials. The other thing that's available at the library is the, the Daily Illini is also digitized and has been uh, heavily used for the research here. Um, and one, uh, two more things to cite. Obviously, I use the memoirs of uh, Colin and of uh, Florence, um, which has been wonderful to receive from them. Uh, Ellen Evner's story, yeah. Basically, I've been collecting stories for 10 years now, so, yeah. Yes? Correct, correct. And, and, uh, and now another folklore, I don't, uh, right. So, so that's, the folklore is, what, what happened was they built Northwestern, they built, they built the one here, they built the one in Ann Arbor. All of that took four years. And then on the fourth year, the Northwestern one started leaking and then the hour started leaking. That's the, that's the folklore. I, I'm not, you know, don't sue me on this for this. Um, yeah. So uh, there was a small house I don't know to tell you exactly which corner of the premises, but there was a small house. Oh, this building. We're asking about this building. McKinley across the street, uh, which are still great partners for us today, and we still do a lot of things with them today. The McKinley relationship goes all the way back to Rabbi Frankel. Another story that I wanted to put and wasn't sure if we'll have the time. Rabbi Frankel created with um, someone from McKinley and someone from uh, Newman, um, a, an interfaith prayer, amazing prayer, uh, that as far as we can tell was lost until we digitized the uh, Hillel post and we brought it back and we actually shared it with the Hillel movement and it's being used across campuses right now. So, sorry, I don't know it by heart. I mean, you know, at some point they switched from rabbi directors to executive directors, and I, you know, and they're good at my day job, and I hired Heather because she's the best in the business. So, uh, of being senior Jewish educators, we also have a great rabbi, a great pulpit rabbi here. 
Um, so, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I need to pull this. I need to pull this out from last week. A lot of information passed through my brain since then, but it was it was it was no, no, it was English history, but it was uber specific. It was something about I think the House of Tudor, like it was it was about the furn furniture or something like that in the palace. It was so specific, and and I thought I I will never forget this. Um, and, and of course, after reading, after scrolling through the DI and the Hillel Post for the past two weeks, it's gone. But I'll, I'll get you the answer. Uh, but it was something uber specific about English history and specifically about royal English history. Um, and what I wanted to say, not only was he, was he not a rabbi, but he did officiate weddings. And so he got, he got, a, he got a license from the, from the state to officiate weddings here in, in Champaign. Um, but for all intent, intents and purposes, everyone treated him as the rabbi because he led services here in Sinai, all across, whenever he traveled, they would have him lead services because what do you mean? Rabbi Frankel and Rabbi Mann and um, Rabbi, you must be a rabbi too, uh, which I still get referred to as a rabbi sometimes too, um, which I'm not. I'm not. It's a lot of work and I didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Carly, you're missing the question. Did we have weddings here recently? Yeah. We just, uh, two weeks ago, we had a wedding here. And, uh, and now I'll tell the full story. Um, Sorry, I told this to you guys before, but um, so not only we had a wedding right here in this room, uh, the, the, the bride is originally from Champagne. It's, it's uh, Irene Zarnitsky. The, the Zarnitsky family uh, lives in town, um, faculty. And um, so Irene is from here. She was a student president here and her now husband, which is cool. Um, Sam also went to the University of Illinois. They met. Out, out, outside there in the lounge. And um, uh, Sam, if you haven't been in the other room yet, when you leave, go in and take a look. There is a big flag that's, that's uh, uh, four panels that are half Israeli flag and half American flag. He took that from his grandfather, the, the panels he took from his grandfather's barn in central Illinois when the barn was going to be torn down because they were selling the estate after the grandfather passed away. And he, over the summer, he, was, he painted the two flags. So the flags are on both sides, so we can flip them. Um, and he brought that at the end of the summer uh, and said, can you hang this up? And I said, sure, but what made you think about this? And he said, well, there's not a single flag that's up constantly at Hillel. And I wanted to make sure that there is one of both. Um, so he gave that to us. Um, and so not only did the wedding happen here and they have, they have a connection to the, to the building and she was the student president, but their head table was under the flag and he was wearing, he was wearing um, jewelry pieces or different things from grandparents that were no longer here except for his grandfather because he was going to sit under his grandfather's barn. So, uh, so that's, uh, you know, my heart is like, Plus, they transformed the, the, the room in a way that we never never thought possible, and now we're going to replicate a lot. So their weddings happen. We have a lot of couples. Uh, two weeks before this wedding, Carly and I went to Chicago to another some to another person who got married. Uh, Carly actually officiated that wedding. Sorry, the, the the wedding of Irene and Sam. So Carly's my assistant director. Um, she's not a rabbi, but she's licensed to to conduct weddings. Uh, so we're giving you a lot of options here. If someone wants to get married, we have Heather, we have Carly. Uh, Rabbi Ellen is here from Sinai. Um, yep. Um, so we, we do. Every year we get couples, and it's the sweetest thing. Yeah. 
We do have time for maybe one more question because I blabber a lot. Oh, we did it all. Thank you. Uh, I will need help finishing the desserts. Otherwise, I'll take them home and I'll finish them. And that's not good. Uh, so feel free to take seconds. Thank you, everyone, for coming.